Here we are in the American Southwest by a road. In ancient times, like in modern times, roads were all important. They connected people, they connected cities, they connected civilizations. Goods were traded on roads. Armies traveled on roads. In fact, the Romans were so committed to building roads that it is said that the Roman Empire built 250,000 miles of roads. 50,000 miles of them were paved and many of them can be seen today. It was on one of those roads that Jesus, after his resurrection, made a very special appearance. But before we get into that story, let me read you an article from the newspaper. It goes like this. On the eve of the annual celebration of the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, the one million inhabitants of this city were shocked by the announcement that a body identified as that of Jesus was found in a long neglected tomb just outside the boundary of the city. Rumors had been circulating last week that a very important discovery was about to be announced. The news, however, far outstrips all of our wildest guesses. The initial reaction of Christians here and around the world has been one of astonishment, bewilderment, and defensive disbelief. We will have to wait and see just what effect this discovery will have on the 2,000-year-old religion. To the mind of this unbelieving writer, it appears that Christianity will have to take its place on the same level with other religions around the world. No longer can its followers claim that unlike other religions, the tomb of its founder is empty. Evidently, a 2,000-year-old lie has come to an end. Now you need to know that's fake news. That's not a real news article. But if that article were true, then our faith is worthless. And all of this celebration at Easter is absolutely stupid. In the words of Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 15, we would be the most miserable people in the world. But that's not the way it is. Because you see, Jesus Christ had three basic credentials. Number one, his impact on history. He died at 33. His ministry was only three years long. He was born in an obscure town up in northern Israel. And yet the impact of that one life reverberates through the hallways of time and history, unlike any other human life. Number two, fulfilled prophecy. You see, the Old Testament made many predictions of the things Jesus fulfilled in his lifetime. Also, third, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, most religions of the world are based upon philosophies, teachings, the postulates of its founders. Of all the world religions, four are based on personalities. That's Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, and Islam. But of those four religions, only the Christian faith claims a resurrection for its founder. The story we're looking at in the Bible today is about two men who are walking on the road. They happen to be on a road to a town called Emmaus, about seven miles, it says, from Jerusalem. And as they're walking and talking, Jesus comes, walks alongside of them, and he starts talking to them. Now, I have actually walked that very road the scripture talks about. It's a beautiful setting. There's eucalyptus trees on either side of the street, and the Mediterranean breeze in the afternoon comes through there. It's beautiful. But on this day, the conversation and the faces of those walking the road were very sad and very gloomy. You see, they're reviewing what just happened in Jerusalem in recent days. Jesus came to the city. One of his followers named Judas betrayed him. Jesus was then arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went through six separate trials before he was condemned a criminal's death and taken to a cross outside the city of Jerusalem and crucified. So they're sad, like anyone would be after any funeral. After a funeral, people generally have an empty feeling and they feel the need to talk things out, to vent about what just happened. In fact, I would say they're at the lowest point of their lives because they had certain expectations, expectations of the Messiah, the one they believed Jesus to be. They had left everything to follow him. But now to them, that's all over. You see, 
the Jews of that time connected the Messiah with what, what they called in Hebrew, Olam Haba, which means the end of days or the world to come, literally. They were expecting that this was the end of the age, that Jesus was the Messiah, but that he would be a conquering Messiah. So they expected a conquering Christ. What they got was a crucified Christ. They were expecting the raging lion of Judah. What they got was the gentle lamb of God. They may have even felt totally abandoned by God until this story. And what I want to show you is five principles to help you relate to the risen Christ this Easter. The first principle is this, your God is on the move. Listen to that again, your God is on the move. Now some of you are saying, well, he's not my God, but I believe that's gonna change. I believe that throughout this broadcast and by the end, some of you are actually gonna change your relationship with God. Your God is on the move, listen to this. It says, now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And so it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now we're not told why these two disciples are on the road to Emmaus. I'm guessing they probably were from there. That was their home. They had been following Jesus for months, maybe even for a few years, but that's over. They're now calling it quits. They're going back home because all of that they're thinking now is just a pipe dream. But soon the two-way conversation that they have with each other becomes a three-way conversation as Jesus edges his way up to them, sidles himself beside them and starts entering into a conversation. Now, you got to understand, they're not looking for Jesus. That's the last person they expect to show up. Jesus, in their mind, was dead. This whole following Jesus bit is over. This brings up an important point. People are not really looking for God, even though they say they are. And I, I've heard people for years, I still hear it all the time. People say, I'm, I'm searching for God. I'm on a search for spiritual truth. Actually, that's not true. You're not looking for God. The truth is God, has been and is looking for you. He's looking for you. You see, God isn't lost, you are. Back in Genesis chapter three, we're told Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God. God came into their world. God showed up on their road, you might say, and said, where are you? God was looking for them. In the New Testament, Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's looking for people. And even Jesus compared God to a shepherd, a good shepherd who would leave 99 sheep and seek the one who was going astray. And here's what's beautiful. This sets Christianity apart from every other belief system, every other religion in the world. You see, religion is essentially man's attempt at reaching up toward God, trying to grab a hold of God, appeasing God by their own works, their own effort. And so some religions will tell their followers to inflict pain upon themselves, to be holy, crawl on their knees in prayer, or pray a number of times on a certain day, or face in the right direction when they pray, or worship God on a specific day at a specific time. But the Bible presents God on the move, reaching out to us. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. God is on the move. He's on the road with you and he wants to be part of your journey. He's trying to get your attention. He wants to reveal himself to you. And in a few moments, I'm gonna ask you to make a move toward God. So that's the first principle. Second, your eyes aren't always right. The story continues and says that as Jesus came up and spoke with them, it says, so it was he conversed and reasoned. Jesus drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. So get this, they're looking at him they're talking to him, they're walking with him, but they don't recognize it is him. 
They thought he was a stranger, a visitor, an outsider. In fact, a few verses down, they even ask him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? You don't know the things that have happened in this town? Now, I have a very basic question. Why don't they recognize Jesus? If they've been following him for some time, wouldn't they recognize him? Well, first of all, you gotta understand, they weren't expecting him. The resurrection was not even on their radar screen. They were not expecting Jesus to suddenly show up. Second, the crucifixion that Jesus underwent was brutal. And he may have even undergone some physical changes. He was beaten with a flagellum or a whip that would strike his back and pull out chunks. He was struck on the face by soldiers with their hands. And Isaiah the prophet predicted that his beard would be plucked out and his appearance, his visage, would be marred more than any other man. And this happened a few times actually, where people didn't recognize Jesus even after the resurrection. Mary in the garden thought it was a gardener even though Jesus was standing right in front of her. On the shores of the Sea of Galilee, the disciples were in the boat and Jesus was on the shore talking to them, but they were unaware it was him. But the real reason that they didn't recognize him tells us in the text. It says their eyes were restrained or their eyes were fixed or holden, one translation says. Another translation says God kept them back from recognizing him. Now, why would he do that? Why would God not want them to recognize that this was Jesus, the resurrected Lord? You would think it would be the very opposite. Well, let me give you a couple reasons why they didn't recognize him and why God didn't want them to at first. Number one, so they would be honest. You know, I don't think they'd ever talk to Jesus the way they were talking to him if they knew it was him. I don't think they would say, hey, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? And so I think that probably just to get them to be honest, he didn't want to reveal himself to them. You know, we're not always honest. When we talk to people, we often tell them things that we think they want to hear. A lot of times when people find out what I do, they have a reaction. We'll be having a conversation. They may be speaking to me very honestly. And then when they say, well, what do you do? And I tell them, I'm a pastor. Suddenly they change. They talk differently. Oh, I'm so sorry. I said what I just said. And they start acting squirrely around me. You know, in ancient times, kings would sometimes dress like peasants and walk among the people just to find out what the people were thinking about how the king was doing in his reign. He wanted them to be honest. There's another reason. I think that Jesus wants to reveal himself to his disciples differently, not by sight, but by speech, by his word. He wanted his word, the scriptures, to have their maximum impact. And frankly, at this point, it would be impossible if they saw that it was the risen Christ. They would have a completely different reaction. That's an important truth. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, not by seeing, by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, people say, if I could just see God, I'd believe. Or if I just had a sign, then I'd believe. First of all, that's very shallow. If your faith is based upon a sign. Second, it wouldn't last very long because the first time you experienced another hardship in your life and you didn't get a follow-up sign, you'd cash it all in. Has God been speaking to you? I bet he has. And I bet you haven't even recognized it. You see, what you see and experience is not always the whole truth. You may be going through a dark time right now and you're thinking, God doesn't care about me, God has abandoned me, he has forsaken me, he doesn't even know I exist. That's not true. You're not seeing clearly. He cares for you. And the proof of that is you're here today watching this, hearing these words. God is revealing himself to you through his word. So your God is on the move and your eyes aren't always right. Here's a third principle, your hope can become fragile. The story continues. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you are having with one another as you walk and are sad? And then one of those whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? 
So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they didn't find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Now, in this little story, Jesus comes up to them and he is asking them questions. Now, he already knows the answer, but he's asking them questions to draw them out so they will admit their condition and their doubt. So the first question is what they're talking about. He walks up and he says, hey, what kind of conversation are you guys having? You see, he could tell they were sad. Somebody once said, the face always betrays the heart. He could see it written all over them. They were sad. So he said, what are you talking about? You know, the Lord is interested in our conversations about him. He's interested in what we think about him. I love a scripture in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, those who feared the Lord spoke with each other and the Lord listened. And a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who loved to think about his name. God is interested in what you think about him. And so he asked them, what are you talking about? The second question is the funniest because they said, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and you don't know what has happened about these things that have happened? And he said to them in verse 19, what things? That's a funny question because he was at the very heart of those things. He was at the very core of what happened in Jerusalem. But he asked them a question. This is a, a classic Jesus way of drawing a person out to get them to articulate what they're thinking. Jesus did this before with his own disciples in Matthew 16. He said to them one day, who do men say that I am? It's not that Jesus didn't know what people thought about him, but he wanted to hear his disciples talk about that. And then he said, who do you say that I am? The answer of these two disciples reveals just how fragile their hope had become. They're speaking about Jesus in the past tense. They said he was a prophet, not he is a prophet. They said we were hoping in him, not we are hoping in him. It's all past tense. To them, he is not alive. It's all in the past. Their hopes, their dreams were shattered. You might even say they felt like God let them down. They really thought this guy Jesus was the one, but he's dead. You see, when Jesus was buried in that tomb, all their hopes were buried with him. When that door was closed up on the tomb, it closed a chapter in their lives. That's how they felt. Does that describe you? Have you been disappointed by life? Have your hopes and dreams been dashed? You might even say, I used to believe in God. I once had hope in Jesus Christ, but no more. Well, you're not alone. A lot of people have felt that way. You know, Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, couldn't accept the miraculous events in the scripture. He actually edited his own version of the Bible and he deleted all references to the supernatural. And when it came to the Gospels, he kept only the moral teachings of Jesus, took away healings, took away miraculous stuff, took away the resurrection. His closing words in his edited version of the New Testament were these, there laid they Jesus and rolled a great stone at the mouth of the sepulcher and departed. That's how it ended. To Thomas Jefferson, like these two disciples, it was the end of the story, but not so. There's more yet. So your God is on the move. Your eyes aren't always right. Your hope can become fragile. The fourth principle in relating to the risen Christ is that your faith has different speeds. Your faith has different speeds. Listen to this. Jesus comes up to them and says, O foolish ones 
and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? They mentioned the idea in this conversation about the resurrection, about the women who went to the tomb. But to them, it's a wives' tale. It's a myth. They're thinking, these crazy women, they're all emotional. They went to the tomb early. They thought they saw angels, whatever. And so Jesus now responds to them and gives them a gentle rebuke. He says, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. That's very important. You see, they believed some of what the prophets spoke. They believed the parts they liked. They believed the conquering Messiah part, the kingdom on earth part, but they didn't believe the suffering parts of the Old Testament that predicted Jesus' suffering and death and especially resurrection. And here's a point I want to make. Faith, your faith, has different speeds. You see, some people are quick to believe. Their faith goes like from zero to 60 in three seconds. Others are slower on the uptake. It takes them a while to believe. It can even slow down. Years ago, my dad gave me a car. It had a small engine in it. it. Didn't go very fast. It was like zero to 60 in three days. So I tried things to speed it up. I put fuel additives in there. I put an overdrive in it. Um, basically, this car loved going downhill with the wind. It wasn't very fast. Many are slow to believe the Bible. They love the parts where God cares about them, where God blesses them. They love all the parts that promise God's protection, financial help, physical health, peace, love, joy. But they're slow of heart to believe other parts of the scriptures, like he's coming again, or the promises about heaven and hell, or what the Bible says about marriage and divorce. Now, I don't know what speed your faith is, but maybe it has slowed down over time. Maybe you're slow of heart to believe. Well, if you're slow to believe, then you'll also be slow to receive God's comfort and joy and purpose. Maybe even your faith today is at a standstill. What you need to know and what I want to impress on you is Jesus is on the road. He's on the move. He's looking for you and he can take your faltering faith and your fragile hope and boost it up. The fifth and final principle is this. Your Bible should give you heartburn. Yep, you heard it right. Your Bible should give you heartburn. Not the physical kind, but the spiritual kind, the best kind. It says in verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going. And he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him saying, abide with us or stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as he sat at table with them that he took bread, blessed it, broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Basically, he gave them a Bible study. It was the best Bible study anyone has ever heard. So your Bible should give you heartburn. I don't mean gastroesophageal reflux like millions of Americans get every day. I'm talking about spiritual heartburn. One translation puts it this way. Did we not feel our hearts on fire? Or another translation says, didn't we feel our hearts glowing? We still use this phrase whenever we describe our love and our commitment. If couple um, is in love and their love wanes, we will say their love has grown cold. Or if somebody gets excited about their spiritual journey, their faith, we will say he's on fire for the Lord. John Wesley talked about his own conversion and he said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. Let me just say, this is a great need today because 
In modern Christianity, we have lots of information, lots of resources. You can get online, you can get on your phone, you can look up any Bible verse, any Christian song, watch any video. But I have a question, where's the burning? Where's the passion? Where's the spiritual passion that is needed? Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. I might say many are Christians, but most are frozen. Now, what caused this heartburn, this burning, this passion within them? It doesn't say, didn't our hearts burn within us while he looked at us with those eyes of his? Nor did they say, didn't our hearts burn within us while we talked to him? No, their hearts burned when they stopped talking and started listening to his voice. Now, what did he talk about? He talked about the same scriptures they heard all their lives, stuff they grew up with. They'd heard it all before, but they never heard it like this. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures things concerning himself. And when they heard Jesus explain the scriptures, it was like opening the curtains and having the light flood the room. This burning of heart was a new understanding of old things, familiar things. He began at Moses. He probably started with Genesis chapter 3 about the seed of the woman bruising the head of the serpent. He may have moved on to Genesis 22 about Abraham almost sacrificing his own son Isaac on Mount Moriah, the very mountain where Jesus was crucified. Maybe he stopped at Exodus chapter 12 and explained the real meaning of the Passover or Numbers chapter 21 about the serpent being lifted up in the wilderness. No doubt he mentioned Psalm 2, Psalm 22, and certainly Isaiah chapter 53 about the suffering of the Messiah. When Jesus reveals himself, hearts are set on fire. And it's our prayer that God is revealing himself through Christ to you today and that he's going to ignite passion and faith in you. But it says here in our text, he indicated that he would have gone further. That is, he acted like he was just going to keep walking on the road and pass them by. But they said, no, stay with us, stay with us. It's the same on the road of life. Jesus will never force himself on anyone. In fact, he'll pass you by if you want him to. Because you see, he responds by invitation only. He wants you to ask him in. Has your faith slowed down? Is your hope way in the past? Let him come alongside of you on the road and give you spiritual heartburn. He can do it. Your life can change. And just like I said, your God is on the move. And I mentioned early on that I would let you know about making a move toward him. Well, now is the time. Right now where you're at, watching this broadcast, no matter where you're seeing it from, if you're seeing it from our own city or you're seeing it across the country or around the world, ask Jesus into your heart. Let the resurrected Christ burn his passion in your heart.